Hello and welcome to Pod Rocket. I'm Brendan. I'm your host. I'm on the engineering team here at Log Rocket. And joining us today is Mitch Riva. Mitch is a software architect at Nearform, previously worked at some big companies, but most relevant to us, gave a conference talk at the BJS conference titled Compiling and Bundling JavaScript the Painless Way. Mitch, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? All right. Thank you for inviting me. It's it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so compiling and bundling and that being painless, I'm, I'm into that. I think uh, the front end tool chain in general and, and bundling in particular can be one of the most confusing and intimidating parts of the modern web development stack. So I'm excited to have sort of an expert joining us and, and breaking down some of those barriers. And, and maybe we can also talk about what the future of the JavaScript ecosystem and, and tool chain looks like a little bit as well. Um, but before we get into all of that, maybe you could introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your background and maybe how did you become the kind of person who gives conference talks about JavaScript bundling? Okay. Yeah. So um, I've, I'm working as a senior software architect at Nearform. Uh, we are a professional services company, uh, mostly specialized in Next.js, uh, sorry, in React.js, Next.js, uh, Node.js, of course. Uh, we are maintaining a lot of open source projects. And um, I'm also a Google developer expert at Microsoft MVP. Uh, so in a developer technologies and Google Cloud Platform. So I would say right now I'm really focused on software architectures. And, but I do also love coding JavaScript, so I will never leave that field. And that's why I keep on you know, working with the new module bundlers, compilers, and, and whatever can help us uh, achieving better results writing more modern JavaScript and target uh, also older platforms, runtimes, and browsers. Yeah, and, and I would imagine that sort of in your day job, you're probably working between a lot of different projects and and maybe seeing a lot of different environments and and setups and and tool chains um, is that kind of how you got familiar with with this whole area like where does this sort of interest or or expertise in bundling come from okay so the first time i looked into react it was around i don't know 2014 2015 can't really remember but i remember there were uh, there was create react app where you could spin up uh, a new application from scratch in like 2 minutes and it has been a game changer for us because the, the biggest pain point for everyone learning react at that time was uh, webpack configuration so i struggled a lot uh, getting used to the webpack configuration and I got to say, it's not really changed over the time, the feeling that I have with Webpack, even though I love it. I totally love it. Uh, and we will, maybe we can discuss about why I love it so much later on. Uh, but since then, I've always struggled trying to find a better alternative. And, uh, and it's not easy. Uh, so I wanted to give talks about that topic to make people you know, aware that we have other alternatives get, that you know, can be the right solution for their problems. Yeah, and, and maybe that's a good opportunity to kind of step all the way back to the beginning and and ask how we got here as an ecosystem. Like, why do we even need tools like Webpack? What do they do? How did we how did we get into a place? You know, if I have a Python script, I just run my Python script. Uh, so what's made JavaScript sort of so different as, as an ecosystem and as a language that we need all of this tech? That's a really cool question. Uh, there are multiple answers, I would say. So, for example, uh, if we are talking about Node.js or Dino or a server-side runtime uh, in general, you might not need a bundler. And that's because you have a module system. So with Node, we used to have uh, CommonJS, for example, where you could require other modules. Nowadays, we have uh, ECMAScript modules, so you can directly import instead of requiring modules. But that was not the case for the browsers. So back in the, time, uh, back in the day, I was talking about React uh, with a you know, Webpack default configuration. In 2015, we didn't have direct imports in browsers. So we needed to bundle up the code into a single executable file and serve it over the net. So that was the use case, the main, I would say the primary use case for module bundlers, where you couldn't dynamically import code directly from the browser but you had to bundle it. And Webpack, it's specifically, it, it's really good at doing that, uh, even though it has some complexities. And for that reason, many competitors started to, to grow, such as Rollup, Purcell, and then Veet and Snowpack and whatever. Uh, but yeah, they really helped us achieve the web we have today. 
Right. And, and I think there's also um, an aspect of, of optimization to that as well, where as the web has become more performance focused, bundlers and, and compilers as well have become very focused on, on improving those sort of core web metrics. Um, has that been a big part of the, the development of the like bundling and, and tool chain ecosystem as well? Yeah, I would say if we talk specifically about bundling, um, we started to think of our code as uh, tree shakeable, for example. So some model bundlers, uh, not every single one, but the most popular ones uh, started to integrate a tree shaking technology, for example. So um, some duplicated code can be, for example, instantiated only once via singleton pattern, other code, uh, that can be identified as a dead code can be thrown away, or we can also fragment the code and make it lazy so that we only uh, load it when it's really needed. So module bundlers has become more complex over the time, but also very powerful to you know match up the expectation of a faster web as the time goes on. Um, and I also like the distinction you you drew there between sort of the the bundling and compiling aspect that I think usually we kind of merge into one in our head, it, our sort of code comes into Webpack and it comes out the other side bundled and, and compiled. But could you talk a little bit about what the difference between those processes is and, and how they sort of each contribute to what we need from a, a product like Webpack? Yeah, absolutely. So we just discussed about bundling, so I, I won't go over, over it again, uh, but I can talk to you about you know compiling. And when we refer to compiling, uh, we refer to that process to transform um, a code written in a high level programming language into machine code or bytecode, generally speaking. So when we talk about JavaScript specifically, uh, we should talk about transpiling or transcompiling, meaning that we are not targeting uh, the machine. So we are not targeting bytecode or binary code, but we are basically translating a source code into another source code. For instance, uh, we have, I don't know, uh, we, we can transcompile from one language to another. We might have Scala, for example, or Kotlin, or basically every single language that nowadays gets compiled via the LLVM framework could potentially uh, transcompile to JavaScript. So uh, that is the transcompilation process. You have a Scala script and you feed the compiler and get the JavaScript in return. So there's, there's you know, on the one hand, there's this more esoteric um, Transpilation process where you're right, you can take sort of any language and, and get JavaScript out. And I think the other major use case has been sort of getting features that are sort of coming to the to the language or sort of have mixed support across browsers um, to be sort of available to you as a developer consistently. Um, is that sort of in your mind all the same type of, of tooling or same type of process, or do you see that sort of JavaScript dialect? to sort of browser runnable JavaScript as a different type of thing. So the concept is almost the same. Uh, if you want to transpile from one language to JavaScript, it's almost the same process you need to do for uh, a superset of JavaScript to JavaScript. So for instance, TypeScript is definitely a superset of JavaScript. If you want to target JavaScript as a compiler output for TypeScript, you can do that. But uh, you need to go through all the steps you need for uh, compiling a language. So you have to, uh, to tokenize it, you have to parse it, you have to create an abstract syntax tree, you have to traverse that tree to understand if the syntactic, uh, if the syntax, if the semantics are correct, if the scope for the variables is correct. You know, you have to do many things. And at a certain point, you have to decide, will I target a bytecode or machine code, or will I target JavaScript? So this is where we make a distinction. Uh, if you want to compile, you go with bytecode, machine code, wherever. If you want to transpile, you transpile to a subset, so from TypeScript to JavaScript, or directly you transpile to another language. So that's case, for example, for ReasonML targeting JavaScript, OCaml, Uncalling, Gleam, and all the languages that targets JavaScript. But the concept is still the whole compilation process, except for the code generation, that it's the different one uh, between compiling one language to machine code than transpiling to JavaScript. Yeah. Um, I, another thing that, that we've sort of mentioned is that all of this from our perspective as developers, most of the time until it breaks, it sort of happens behind the scenes and, and is not something that I think a lot of people are thinking about day to day. Uh, why do you think this is such an important 
topic for developers to be aware of and, and be thinking of? Uh, because I would say, as developers, we take most we take many things for granted, uh, I would say. So we say, okay, I want to use uh, the latest JavaScript features. I want to use them on all the browsers and runtimes. I will just use Babel, but I need to understand how Babel works for many different reasons. For example, reason number one, I might want to uh, create my own plugin for Babel because Babel is powered by a plugin system and it's the de facto uh, compiler for JavaScript. So whenever I want to interact with the JavaScript source code at the compilation level, I need to understand how I want to do that. And now you might be wondering, uh, why would I ever start a conversation like that? I mean, why should I want to compile JavaScript myself? That's a cool question, and I can answer you with, for example, CodeBots. So if you want to refactor a large-scale application and, and you don't want to do that manually, uh, you can read the source code, you can read the abstract syntax tree, understand how the code is formatted, understand the logic behind the code, and make some changes uh, dynamically, automatically, by writing, for example, a JS code shift which is based on Babel, on Recast, and other compilers and tokenizers out there. Right. So it's not just, you know, it's not just rewriting code by sort of manipulating it as a, a, a string input, but actually decomposing it structurally. And that's where you gain the ability to do sort of really sophisticated transformations. Yeah, that's correct. You can also run some interesting optimization. So for example, if I have an upsat syntax tree for our JavaScript code base that says, okay, this is a binary operation. It's a um, addition. So on the left side, you have 10. On the right side, you have 10. We know that's a binary operation. If I read the upsat syntax tree while transpiling my code, I could say, why should I ever do that at runtime? Let me run the addition at compile time so that you save some some space, some memory, some speed at runtime. So I, I mean, okay, that's a silly example, but uh, I mean, if, if you think of that at the scale, uh, then can be really interesting to be able to interact with the compiler itself. Right, and, and I think there you're getting some of the optimizations that you would expect if you were writing a like very traditional compiled language like C or, or Rust that you would expect the compiler to do for you, you're getting in, in JavaScript by, by virtue of being able to sort of process your code. That's absolutely correct. So yeah. let's, uh, for example, uh, let's say you use the dot map method in JavaScript. So you basically have an array and you create a new array back, okay? Uh, if you're not used to that functional pattern, but you want to uh, loop over an array and push elements to another one after transforming them, you could do that uh, by creating an empty array and pushing elements, right? That's a good pattern, but it's not perfect. Uh, knowing the size of the original array, you could create a new array with that same length and then push to the individual uh, memory allocation for, for every individual index. So that's an optimization you can do at compile time uh, while transpiling from JavaScript to JavaScript just for the sake of optimizing the runtime process. And I, I think it might be a good time to now switch gears from this sort of general overview of, of what we're doing and why to talking about some of the specific technologies, because that's another big part of the ecosystem. You mentioned Webpack and, and Babel, some of probably the things that everyone's heard of, but there's a whole new generation of build and, and bundling tools, ES Build, Beat, Snowpack, that are sort of coming online now or, or in the past couple of years. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what's behind both that proliferation of tools and what are they doing that's new or, or different from each other that might make us want to choose one versus another. There are tools such as Webpack that only does one thing and does it very well. So it's it's not really true that it does just one thing because it's capable of doing many things. But uh, at its core, it's a bundler. So you give it many files, it outputs just one uh, one single file. So that that's the main purpose. Uh, we have, as you were saying, a new generation of tools such as Vite. Uh, built by Ivan Yu, the creator of Vue.js, uh, that it's now capable of doing more. It's not just a module bundler, it's a development server. Uh, it uses ESBuild, which may, maybe we will be talking more later, um, but uses ESBuild um, uh, as a local uh, development tool for speeding up your build times and refresh times. And most important, it's a build uh, bundling tool that doesn't bundle code. 
So that's pretty strange, but it basically runs a series of optimizations, et cetera, and compilations and whatever you need, and it outputs uh, ESM modules. So you basically get uh, modern modules in return, and you can basically use them on the browsers without the need of bundling one single executable, which is pretty good. And, and so is that something that sort of can exist now, but couldn't exist in the past because of changes in the browser ecosystem and, and what browsers are able to support? Or, you know, why why does this tool get built in, in 2022 as opposed to, you know, 2015? You are absolutely correct. So uh, the fact that the browsers are getting more modern and we finally dropped support, for example, for Internet Explorer, that was blocking most of the uh, new age <laughs> you know, compilers and bundlers. So uh, we now have a situation where we can really experiment with very different stuff uh, for bundling and shipping our code. So I guess that's one of the reasons why we had to wait for such a long time uh, to get this kind of great tooling. And we, I, I feel like we haven't exploited yet the full potential of many of those tools. For example, we might talk about SWC, uh, which is a project nowadays maintained by Vercel, uh, which is a building. Uh, it's a building tool, so it, it's a compiler. Um, it's still in beta, but could also be a bundler, which is tot- uh, completely written in Rust. That means that it could potentially run on the browser, and that's super interesting. I don't know if anyone have tried doing that. But it's exciting to know that we have a possibility there. And and so what would be some of the implications of that? Are there sort of potential projects you can can think of that would be sort of particularly able to benefit from being able to run this tool in, in the browser? Or is that sort of what you're thinking of as as the area we haven't explored yet? I will be brutal here, but for example, you run on a um, on a very old uh, browser. Okay, you w- won't be supporting WebAssembly, so that's not the case. But if you are on a, let's say, quite new but still old browser that supports uh, WebAssembly, but it's not up to date. So okay, only for you I can transpile the code, for example, or I can publish my code to a CDN and then get it trans transcompiled um, as as it was a just-in-time compilation directly on the browser. I don't know. Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe it's a bad one. I have no idea about that. I don't have benchmarks. Uh, but I guess it opens to a world of possibilities. And it's a great time to be an innovator in that field, thanks to those uh, tools. Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about SWC. We've talked a little bit about Vite. What are some of the other sort of new or, or exciting tools in the space? And what's their sort of claim to fame or, or the thing they're doing that's interesting? So I would say yes, Build is one of those. Uh, it's definitely an exciting technology building Golang. Um, I remember I, I wrote some time that it has been built with speed in mind. So uh, speed was a top priority for uh, um, even Wallace, I, I think, wrote it. So the uh, former CTO of Figma, um, so he wrote, uh, uh, ES build, which is basically a bundler, a compiler, and uh, um, it's capable of outputting uh, code in a very fast manner. So uh, it, it's also used by, as we were saying, by Vite. It was used by Snowpack. I'd like to talk more about Snowpack, but it's dead. <laughs> it's a dead project, super sadly. Um, but it's also cool to know how Snowpack worked because I feel like it was really similar to something we have today with Webpack, which is Module Federation. And Module Federation is the reason why today I still use Webpack. So we have many things to discuss, I would say. <laughs> yeah, well, you you said that you you love Webpack and you wanted to, to have a chance to talk about, about why. So maybe this is a good point to, to pose you that question. Um, you know, why, why do you love Webpack despite perhaps the, the challenge we've all faced of trying to figure out what the heck all those options do? <laughs> exactly. So Webpack, it's not easy. I, I've i been stuck for like five months trying to upgrade uh, Webpack 4 to Webpack 5 on a very large code base in the past. So I know it can be painful. Uh, but the fact is that it's really mature. And if you want to interact with your compilation process or bundling process, it allows you to do that. And also it opens to a world of optimizations. For example, 
the ones that uh, gets done by uh, Module Federation plugin. Uh, so for those who don't know what Module Federation is, it's a new way of uh, shipping code, basically, in real time, possibly, where you have, for example, a React application made with Create React App that will work just fine. You select individual components, scripts, types, whatever you want, and you can serve them as individual components. But the good thing is that thanks to the way that Webpack works, the module federation plugin is able to say, okay, you're using a navbar. That navbar uses three button components. You're now using also a header, which uses one button component. I will read the abstract syntax tree, and I will give you just one reference for that button. So the cool thing is that you will be shipping code with very few repetitions highly optimized, and that's because Webpack is super cool at doing this stuff. And it's really easy to interact with the compilation and bundling process. So we are capable of building something really special, such as module federation. Mm -hmm. And is that, you know, you, you mentioned both the maturity and the architecture of, of Webpack. Is that, is that level of optimation, optimization um, an artifact of, you know, this project is having been around for so long and then having been sort of battle tested against the needs of people working in large code bases? Um, or is it, it specifically the architecture and, and design of Webpack that sort of lets you solve those problems? I would say both. Uh, so Webpack has been a community-driven project for a very long time. Nowadays, the, uh, the creator of Webpack works at Vercel, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, so first of all, we know that it will have some good support for a very long time. So having a big company uh, supporting your project, it's, it's something good. In the past, we had other companies contributing also financially to Webpack, which is not something we can take for granted when we talk about open source projects. So thanks to the financial support, thanks to the uh, rich community, uh, thanks for uh, to the fact that it was the de facto uh, bundling tool uh, in the um, React rising he era. <laughs> you know, uh, Webpack has become very popular, well supported, and there are many developers nowadays that really know how to make it work properly. So even if it's really complex for enterprise projects, it's still a good idea. If you're starting your own website, uh, personal website or site project, maybe Vit or uh, Parcel are good options. But if you wanna go on an enterpri enterprise scale application, then Webpack, it's well suited for the task. I feel like uh, a latent theme here that we've sort of touched on a couple of times is the developer experience of these tools, both the challenges of the developer experience with Webpack and also the way that, you know, SWC and, and Vite have focused on providing more all-in-one functionality and, and more pieces of the tool chain together. Is that something you see as, as a trend that's going to continue, that there's going to be more sort of developer focus in the, in like where these tools go in the future? Will there be more specialization? Like, what do you see as the, the big trends I would say, you know, that's that's a nice question also. Uh, I would say the trend would be to be as developer-friendly as possible. So if I have to bet, I would bet on the fact that the next generation of bundlers will move into a developer-friendly uh, way. So convention over configuration, for example, uh, more fast tools such as yes, uh, yes build underneath. Um, also, Vercel is nowadays uh, sponsoring a project where you uh, where they're basically uh, rewriting, uh, or sorry, no, they're porting TSC, so the type, TypeScript compiler uh, in Golang to make it faster. So uh, that, that's basically and purely a developer experience um, based um, porting. On the other hand, I would say there will be a niche of tools that will stay on the productivity side, where by productivity, I mean uh, being able to do whatever you want out of a configuration. So Webpack, it's here to stay. Um, I'm sorry for those who find it really uh, complicated. I'm one of those, but sometimes you really need it. And I guess I'm curious if, if you wanted to sort of Think about what are you know what are some of the pain points or or unsolved problems in bundling or transpiling or or the sort of JavaScript toolchain in general that you know you would like to see solved in the next few years. 
Okay, I would say uh, bundling time, it's definitely a pain point. And for example, VIT, it's capable of solving that uh, with, a, with a constant time. So uh, if we talk about O notation, for example, we can say that the compilation time for VIT, it's O1. So uh, if you have like 10 dependencies with Webpack, which is linear, so ON, uh, the, um, the compilation time required grows as your uh, linearly as your number of dependencies grows. So if you have, for example, 10 packages with Webpack, you change one dependency, you have to rebuild them all, okay? With Vit, we don't have that. We only rebuild the one that we change, so it's faster. So I guess that's uh, the pain points that the bundlers, module bundlers are addressing right now, and I'm really happy about that, even though I would say that in the future, my goal would be to have Oh, sorry, my prediction would be that we have no bundler at all. So we won't need bundlers at all because of ECMAScript modules, because of browser getting more modern. And uh, so that's that's my hope. That's not only a prediction. <laughs> so I really hope uh, being there as fast as, as possible. And is the, I guess the, the big obstacle there as always is, is probably browsers and, and browsers converging on being able to support, you know, the exact same set of functionality and, and operations. I'd also say that the TC39 committee, it's doing an awesome work, uh, getting some cool specifications for browsers. And I would say that also the browsers are moving really fast and, and well. So we have uh, basically Chromium-based browsers uh, and Mozilla, Firefox, and Safari. Uh, these are the main, we have just three browsers today uh, that needs to, to support new features. While 10 years ago, we had a, a more, a variety of browsers that needed to, to catch up with the latest features. So today I would say it's easier for us to get into uh, a direction that is uh, dictated by TC39 or you know the, the, all the committees behind individual browsers. All right. Well, Mitch, thank you for joining us. Before we go, is there anything you'd like to point our listeners to? Uh, anything they should check out or, or where to find you online? Um, yeah, I would recommend anyone going to the ESBuild website. There is an awesome benchmark where it's basically comparing the compilation speed and bundling speed of ESBuild against Parcel, Webpack 5, and Rollup. And I won't spoil anything. You will see how fast it is uh, compared to traditional uh, bundlers. And it's really a game changer. So um, I, I will leave you there. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll leave it on a cliffhanger. Mitch, thank you. It's great to have you on the podcast and we'll see you online. Thank you again.